Now, this is probably not the way that you might have seen your instructor explain this, and this is not the way you would generally solve these problems. There's rules that your instructor might have mentioned for figuring out oxidation number, and you can usually use those rules, but there's a lot of rules, and the rules are much easier to remember if you understand where they're coming from. For example, you might have learned the rule that oxygen usually has a negative 2 oxidation number, but now we can see why. Oxygen is more electronegative than just about anybody else. So it's generally going to be gaining the electrons in its bonds, and generally oxygen makes two bonds, so it's generally going to gain two electrons. So that explains the rule that oxygen usually has a negative two charge, because oxygen is in, you can also remember that because oxygen is in the second column from the right here. So oxygen wants to gain two electrons to get a noble gas configuration. So that helps us to remember why they should have negative two. Also a rule is that hydrogen usually has a plus one charge, and we can see why that is, because hydrogen is less electronegative than pretty much all the other nonmetals. Hydrogen is about the least electronegative of all the nonmetals, so it tends to lose its one electron. On the other hand, if hydrogen was bound to a metal, it would have a negative one charge. If hydrogen was bound to a metal, it would have a negative one charge, because hydrogen is more electronegative than the metals over here. So that, um, those are rules, but it, um, we can understand those rules better if we understand uh, the model here. Okay, so it, you generally you should use the rules, but it's easier to remember them if you, if you understand that they're all coming from this ionic bonding model. Uh, do you have your textbook with you? Okay, now actually this is a little confusing because since you're in the second semester, probably last semester you guys already went over redox a little bit, and now you guys are kind of going into more detail, so I don't know exactly how your instructor is covering this. Did your instructor even talk about finding oxidation numbers in lecture? No. Did you have any homework problems about that? Not yet, but we took first semester of chem five years ago, ah. so <laughs> that's over a little bit. Right. To okay, so I'm not sure how much emphasis your instructor is going to put on this, um, but you might need this still because now you're going into electrochemistry again. I'm sorry, you were going to say? Yeah, I was going to say that he's dealing this with a D block. He's using the redox reactions with the D block, so that's why he mainly knows that. Oh, well, now I know that he, uh, he talked about oxidation states for the D block, but actually, um, now you guys are just moving into a whole different chapter on, re on redox reactions in electrochemistry, I think. And in that chapter, it's not going to mainly be about transition metals. It's going to be about galvanic cells and electrochemical cells, um, which doesn't actually have much to do with transition metals. So I know that he talked about oxidation number for transition metals, too. Um, but um, I think now he's actually going to be mainly focusing on it for the main group uh, elements, because there's a whole chapter in electrochemistry, which I think he's covering now, which doesn't mainly focus on the oxidation numbers. So. Okay, so anyway, um, so now I'm thinking, I don't know how much time we want to spend on this, because I don't know whether your instructor is really going to be focusing on this um, or not. Well, we'll do one example, and then we can see how to balance redox reactions, because that's one of the things you said yeah. that he was going over. Okay, so anyway, I just wanted to mention that in your um, book here, there's a list of the rules for finding oxidation numbers, and this is on page uh, 160. It's actually not in the chapter on electrochemistry that you're going over now, because again, this is more of a first semester topic that you might need to review and go back to. So this is on page 160. And uh, so we don't need to go through all the rules, but for example, we can just mention, we already talked about how oxygen usually has a negative two oxidation number, and we can see why, because it wants to gain two electrons to get a noble gas configuration. On the other hand, suppose that you have an element in this column, what would its oxidation number tend to be? Minus one. Minus one, because it tends to gain one electron. And what would the oxidation number tend to be for elements in this column? Plus one. Minus one. Uh, I'm sorry? Plus one. Plus one, yeah, plus one. That's right, because they tend to lose one electron. We just said that oxygen tends to have an oxidation number of negative two, because it tends to gain two electrons, because it tends to be the most electronegative element in the compound. Uh, but there are some exceptions to that. For example, if oxygen is bound to fluorine, 
then it wouldn't be the most electronegative element anymore, and it would actually be losing electrons to the fluorines. That would be one of those rare exceptions. Or how about if two oxygens are bound to each other? Well, then neither is more electronegative than the other, and again, they wouldn't have to have a negative two charge. So if we understand the ionic model, we can also understand the exceptions um, to those rules. Oops. So I'll just do one example. Let's find the oxidation numbers for the elements in this compound. How would we do that? Now, we could do that. That was the method that I just uh, mentioned over here. But again, I wanted to do this just once to give you some intuition for oxidation number. But now let's go back to using the rules, because uh, that's a lot faster for finding oxidation. Minus two is minus six. Right? Oxygen. Right? Well, then that would figure out what sulfur is, right? That's right. So what would that tell us is the charge on the sulfur? Plus six. Okay, good. All right, that's a lot faster than drawing the full Lewis structure, right? All right, um, so each oxygen has a, uh, a bond, a negative two, because oxygen is the most electronegative compound here. The oxygens are going to be taking electrons away from the sulfur. And how many electrons will each oxygen take? Two, to get to its noble gas configuration. But there's three of the oxygens, so they should have a negative six charge overall. But overall, the molecule is neutral. So if this is negative 6, this has to be plus 6. By the way, notice this notation I'm using. This is a good notation to imitate. I like to put the charges for the individual atoms down below. And then you can put the charge for the group of atoms up above. Each individual oxygen here is a negative 2 charge. But because there's three of them, the oxygens all together have a negative 6 charge. So you need to think about both the individuals and the groups. So it helps to have one row for the individuals and one row for the groups. One very useful technique here is you usually start by assigning the oxidation numbers of the most electronegative element. That's why I started with the oxygen and not the sulfur here. Since oxygen is most electronegative, we know it's going to be taking the electrons. And we know it's going to tend to take two electrons, because it's in this column. And then we figured out the sulfur kind of by process of elimination, by what it had to be to balance out the oxygen. So that's the general method. You start with the most electronegative elements. Oftentimes, that's the oxygen. And then you can figure out the other ones. Let's try this problem. Let's try to identify the oxidizing agent and the reducing agent. So the problem here is to find who's the oxidizing agent and who's the reducing agent. Any ideas about how we would start on that? Oxidation numbers. Yeah, to assign the oxidation numbers. Well, what's the oxidation number on this aluminum? Not sure? Now, remember the oxidation number is the charge. Well, what's the charge on the aluminum? I don't know. Zero. Yeah, zero. So they we're not given any charge on this, so we should assume that it's neutral. Since we're not given a charge, we should assume this is neutral aluminum. Um, so this must have an oxidation number of zero. Remember that oxidation number is just a way of measuring charge. Now, this is free aluminum. So this hasn't had a chance to gain or lose electrons. It has the same number of valence electrons as free aluminum because it is free aluminum. So that's, um, we kind of skipped over that, but that's one of the rules. Uh, an element that's by itself has a charge of zero because there just is no charge on this. Okay. Uh, or a monatomic uh, thing has a charge of... Um, zero. Now, how would we find the oxidation numbers here? What should we start with? Oxygen. Start with the oxygen. What are the charges on the oxygen? Four minus three times four minus eight. So I would write the individuals down here and this up above. Now next, we should figure out the charge on these hydrogens. What would their charge be? Plus one into the plus two. That's right. Now how do we know that? That's a little bit more complicated. How do we know? So you're saying the hydrogen is going to lose electrons. How do we know it's going to lose electrons? Because it's bound here to things, to other nonmetals. And we know that hydrogen is the least electronegative of the nonmetals. So when hydrogen is bound to nonmetals, it tends to lose its electrons. If the hydrogen was bound to some metals, it would have a negative one charge and be gaining electrons. Because hydrogen is more electronegative than the things to its left. But hydrogen is less electronegative than these. So the hydrogen here would tend to lose its electrons. 
So then what's the charge on the sulfur? It's plus six. Because overall this has to be neutral. So we left the sulfur for last. There's another way to do this. In the first semester, we're supposed to memorize the common oxyanions, like nitrate and phosphate and sulfate, and we're supposed to memorize what their charges are. If we've got that, if we've got that memorized, we should have memorized that sulfate has a charge of negative two. Or you can look that up. You can look in your index for oxyanions, and there should be a list of them. Sulfate has a charge of negative two. Um, well, then we know that the oxygens have a negative eight, so that also tells you the sulfur has to be plus six, because six minus eight is negative two. So, that's, so we could have figured out the sulfur without even thinking about the hydrogen here, if we remember that sulfate has a charge of negative two, which is stuff from last semester. Um, so that these uh, oxyanions are still coming up this semester, so you might want to find the table in your textbook that reviews those and go back uh, and go over those. So there's two ways to get the correct charges here. Does that make sense? Okay.